Hello, 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 and welcome to Woman to Woman with Lady Ayesha Fisher. We are so happy to have you here on tonight. We are happy that you have chosen to embrace life with us. Amen, amen, amen. We appreciate your presence and your participation. So if you are on, are on uh, Facebook, please go ahead and give StreamYard permission to show your beautiful name and face by clicking that link above this video or yesterday's video, whichever one is easier for you to find, and then go ahead and say hello. That way we will be able to properly acknowledge your presence. Amen. You are in the room of Woman to Woman with Lady Ayesha Fisher, holistic self-care mentor, where we do real talk, real love, real wisdom, real help, and real transformation, should you heed uh, the advice provided by Holy Spirit. Amen. And so if you are blessed, go ahead and be a blessing at paypal.me slash Lady Ayesha Fisher. Any um, seed is welcomed and appreciated. We do holistic uh, health, health, holistic wholeness, holistic health, and that is because the Bible tells us that we are a spirit that has a soul and lives in a body. And so we are intentional to minister to all three parts of our being. One way to do that is to find friends who inspire growth as iron sharpens iron and not just physical growth, but uh, emotional growth and spiritual growth as well. Amen. And so woman to woman provides an opera, a community for you to do just that. Um, a tribe that um, encourages and um, holds accountable and um, uh, challenges you. Amen. And so uh, as I'm trying to press this slide here and it's not moving. <laughs> there we go. And challenges you. And so the challenge that we're doing on this month is uh, taming your fears, practical help for a more practical Practical help for a more peaceful and productive life. Um, the book is is by Deborah Smith Pigues. This is what prompted all of it, but it has gone far and beyond um, my expectations. Amen. And so um, we are going to be um, being intentional to let people know and remind people that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and, and a sound mind. Despite what the devil uses this month of October to do, which is invoke fear in the lives of God's creation, we are coming against that in the mighty name of Jesus by coming live every night at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time inside of the Woman to Woman group, as well as on Twitter and on our webinar, um, which you can find on our um, webpage. And I will provide the link to that just a little bit later. And so what we need to accomplish our goal is the Holy Ghost, the only ghost that should live here in your temple, in your home, in the lives of your children, in your front yard, your backyard, your car, your cubicle is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is who enables us um, to overcome our fears, to overcome sin. Amen. And so we need the, the, uh, the wisdom that Holy Spirit provides. We need the power that Holy Spirit provides as well. And I don't know. Oh boy. Don't know why this slide is giving me trouble, but we're going to work through it. Nothing is going to stop us, amen, because our lives have purpose, our stories are important, our dreams count, our voice matters, and we were born to make an impact in the strategic um, realm of influence that God has placed us in. Um, and so these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing during our challenge some of the things that we have already discussed, some of the things that we're going to discuss moving forward. If any of these things stand out to you, I invite you to come on the screen with me. Let's talk woman to woman. Let's, let's uh, sharpen iron. Let's provide our testimonies. Let's um, provide our expertise. Amen. And so I invite you to do that. You can either inbox me or you can respond to the post that is in the featured section inside of the group. And then I will provide you um, with the link to join me here on the screen. Amen. God's uh, women of powerful influence is who we are. We are we have powerful influence. And so we need to make sure that we're using that influence positively 
for God and not negatively for the world. The main way we do that is by passing down our faith. And faith in what? Faith in God, faith in his word and faith in who he is, his power, his anointing, his healing ability, his provision, his um, his protection, all of that. Right. Passing that down to not only our children and our children's children and our children's children, but everyone who is in our realm of influence. So stay strong. I know it's a strong. It's a, it seems like a big task, but with the help of God, nothing is impossible. Amen. And so stay strong. Your story is not over. God is continuing to write all of our story, and we're going to press on and see what the end's going to be. We have some additional resources on the YouTube page, Family Breakthrough Devotionals, which are um, available for you to tap into as well. Amen. And so who is in the room? Who is in the room? Hello, hello, Sister Nate. Um, good evening, Sister Twy. Oops, I didn't change it. <laughs> good evening, Sister Twyla. Hello, ladies, uh, Sister Teresa, and good evening to you, Sister Talia. Good evening to everyone who may be watching this playback. Um, and we are excited about what God is going to do um, in and through us tonight. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and pray, review, and learn something new. Our review is going to be a summary of what the author discussed in the chapter of the book. And then we're going to go deeper. God has been taking us deeper and deeper and deeper, um, getting to the root of things so that we can uproot them. Amen. So that we can uproot everything that is not like God. It takes work. We got to get we got to get down deep. We got to go deeper so that we can identify what the what what the problem is and then uproot it amen that is the goal and that is what we are going to do amen so let's posture ourselves in humility and to receive what god has for us on tonight father i thank you for you are worthy of all glory honor and praise i thank you for your love and your kindness your grace and your mercy for loving us in spite of us, for fearfully and wonderfully creating us in your image to do great things for your kingdom. I thank you for this, another opportunity to draw closer to you, to gain insight, to gain knowledge, to gain understanding, clarity, revelation, and understanding in your word that we can use in our lives and relate to others. So Father, please help us to do just that, move in our hearts and move in our minds, that we are receptive to what it is that you are presenting to us on tonight, and that we will not be uh, simply here hearers of the word, but doers only. We will, but, but doers also. Um, and so we will hear what you are saying. We will be receptive and then we will take action. We will not just talk about it, but we will be about it by making, uh, making decisions and um, taking actions uh, so that we can change the reality of what we have so that it can we can become all that you have created us to be. And so we're excited about what you're going to discuss with us on tonight, how you're going to heal and deliver on tonight, how you're going to help us to overcome and be strengthened and emboldened to um, to 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 um, embrace who you have created us to be and to gain our strength from Holy Spirit to do all that you have called us to do and left us here on the earth to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. We thank you, God, also for every person that's going to join us, every person that is here right now, and every person that will watch the playback. We thank you, God, for every person that will share this into their realm of influence and get the credit for it. Oh, amen. And so, um, yeah, let's get into it. We appreciate you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So, uh -oh. this is really acting up, huh? That's okay. We're going to keep it moving. The enemy is upset and that's to be expected. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So here we have fears, anxieties, and phobias. Oh my. Fears, anxieties, and phobias. Oh my. Fears, anxieties, and phobias, oh my. So fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by a sense of danger. Fear can be either healthy or harmful. A healthy fear protects us from danger and unhealthy harmful fear invokes danger through a sense of dread or terror that negatively affects our life. Unhealthy fear is a negative learned behavior from either a personal experience or an observed experience. Um, intensified fear leads to anxiety. Uncontrolled fear leads to phobias, 
When we embrace fear, we reject God's willingness to free us from that fear. So choose freedom from fear today. Choose the abundant life Christ offers. As we are learning, it is a choice. Amen. And um, the core fears of anxiety and phobias are rooted in the following core fears. Death and pain, inadequacy, loneliness, helplessness, losing control, and lack. And so when we begin to identify which particular fear we have, we can um, then begin to address it so that everything that is attached to it is dismantled and destroyed. Amen. And so that is our goal as we're going through all of these things. We'll see that a lot of things we didn't think we had issues with, we do. And that's because they're all tangled and in, in, intertwined into um, core fears. And so we're trying to uproot the core, amen, so that healing can take place from within. So let's talk woman to woman. Let's talk woman to woman. And on tonight, we are going to be discussing rejection, taming the fear. Oh, I didn't change it. I didn't change the word. It's changing. It's taming the fear of rejection. So let's just get off of that slide there. <laughs> wow. I didn't change any of this. Am I on the right thing? Y'all, I'm tired. I'm telling y'all, but we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. We're going to get into it. Let me just take this off the screen real quick. So nobody is distracted. What we're talking about is rejection in the mighty name of Jesus. All right. So let's not get distracted and let's go ahead and review um, rejection. So the author says no one is above being rejected. Even God and Jesus experienced it. The Israelites, God's chosen people, rejected his rule over them in favor of an earthly king so they could be like other nations. The people of Nazareth rejected Jesus and his ministry simply because he had grown up in the, up there and they were familiar with him and his family. That's found in Mark chapter six, verses one through six. Fear of rejection is common is a common fear rooted in the core fears of loneliness and the fear of inadequacy. Rejection can leave you feeling isolated. It can also tend to validate your belief that you are inadequate. Going along to get along. You teach people how to value you by you by how you value yourself. If you never express preferences, uh, boundaries, or any other limitation on how others interact with you, they will likely assume you have none and behave towards you in that manner. Notice that even though God and Jesus were rejected, neither responded in a way that encouraged continued rejection. That's good. Even though God and Jesus were rejected, neither responded in a way that encouraged continued rejection. That's good. The key to conquering fear of rejection lies within you. And here's how to break it. Embrace every part of your being with an individualistic mindset. You must believe that you are uniquely designed physically, intellectually, temperamentally, and put on this earth for a specific purpose. You have to believe that. Amen. You must not reject any aspect of God's design or his plan for you. You must not reject yourself. Hallelujah. You must be fully persuaded and emphatically declare for you were formed in my inward for you form me for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. That is Psalm 139 verses 13 through, I didn't read them all, verses um, thir starts at 13 and goes to 16. 16. And so um, remember that Satan is the father of all lies, which is found in John 8 and 44. He used someone to lie to you about your worth or potential. The devil used somebody to lie to you about your worth and your potential and you believe the lie. So now you got to change your thinking. Amen. Decide to reject the lie. Amen. Reject rejection. Reject rejection. 
Make a list of every God-given gift you possess that is or could be a blessing to others. Everybody has a gift. We each have a gift. We just have to begin to view ourselves the way God views us so that we can see what the gifts are. They're there and they have always been there, but some people don't see them because they're blinded by the enemy's lie. Amen. Glory to God. And so we're going to rip off the blinders so that we can see who God has created us to be. Focus on character issues such as integrity, loyalty, generosity, and patience out at faithfulness. That's You don't have that too much nowadays. So if you are a faithful person, if you are a generous person, if you are an, an integrous person, a loyal person, a patient person, a loving person, joyful person, all the fruit of the spirit, kind person, all of those things, those are assets that are beneficial to somebody else. A lot of times we think of talents, like skills, right? But but um, our character can be a blessing to somebody, especially when we live in a world that is so evil and where the, the, the fruit of the spirit is not prevalent. Our very character is a blessing. Our very character can invoke peace and can change atmospheres just when we walk in the room because of our character and the way that we carry ourselves. It's not about having a skill. Amen. We have them tell you, we have to begin to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Amen. So write those things down. I want y'all to actually do that. Get, get, um, put a note. You should be taking notes and put a note to say when, when this is over or tomorrow, I'm going to, I'm going to sit and actually think. Am I, do I have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Those are all character blessings that you, your, your very presence can bring somebody out of, out of a bad mood. You ever, you know, some people, they just show up and smile and you'll just hold everything change because you can just see peace all over them. You can see joy all over them and your whole, and, and everything changes just looking at their smile. Or they talk to you in a sweet, soft voice. And it just is so relaxing and calming. And they just change the atmosphere with their softness. There's a time for soft and there's a time for passion, right? But each, each has its purpose and each has its benefit. Just start there, right? And then you can think about the other stuff that, you, that you're able to do the skills, because we all have skills as well. Amen. Be your authentic self when you are with others. Focus on what you have to give rather than how they perceive it. Be your authentic self. Don't try to be what you, what they think you're going, you should be, what you think they want you to be. None of that. Be you because God fearfully and wonderfully created you in his image for a purpose. And so we need to embrace that and not try to hide it and not try to make it be something other than it is. Amen. That comes with loving ourselves. That, that, that comes with loving ourselves and embracing who God created us to be. Confront behavior that negatively affects you. Jesus commanded it. We can see that in Matthew 18 and 15 and also in Luke 17 and 3. And so we have to begin, we have to learn to communicate our feelings and not keep them bottled up, right? People, people can respect honesty and truth, right? And they might not like it, but they can respect it. And then it changes how they view you. Amen. If you do, uh, if you do encounter rejection, do as Jesus did and move on. Adapt the mind of the Proverbs 31 woman and perceive that your merchandise is good. Do what Jesus did and move on. If people didn't want what Jesus had to offer, he shook the dust from his feet and he kept it moving. He went on to somebody else who wanted what he had. And that's what we have to begin to do. But you have to see yourself as the 31 woman, as the Proverbs 31 woman and perceive that what you have is good. When you receive that what you have is good, you don't cash your pearls on swine. Right. When you perceive that what you have is good. You know your worth, whether somebody else knows it or not, and you walk in that. Amen. 
That's a glorious place to be. Amen. Respect other people's decision not to pursue a relationship with you. Think about the last time you went shopping. Do you Did you purchase every single item that you examined? Of course not. Did you reject them because they were inferior? Of course not. You simply decided that they were not for you or that they were not for you at this point in time, <laughs> right? Don't, don't feel offended because somebody doesn't want to be with you. It's okay. You're not for them and they're not for you. So keep it mo moving and don't waste your time on something that's not for you. Because you want to be with somebody that is going to choose you, that's going to want you at that time in that season, right? If you see a part, <clears throat> if you see a pattern of rejection and you are baffled about that cause, you may want to consider finding out why. Is it because you shopping in the wrong store? <laughs> Or is it because of something that you're doing? Can they see the rejection all over you and they don't want no parts of it? Ask why. Figure out the why. Right? Um, call up a friend. Say, listen, I'd like to get some feedback from you on my personal development. You got, a, you got that kind of friend that's going to tell you the truth whether you like it or not? That's iron sharpening. I want a friend like that. I want you to tell me the truth. Don't, don't give me, don't flatter me. Don't lie to me. Don't try to make me feel good. No, tell me the truth because the truth is what sets you free. That's a friend. Amen. That's a friend. My objective here is not to res uh, resume a relationship. Uh, this is what you're, when you call, ask somebody, this is what your purpose is. I would just like to ask what it was that made you decide to terminate our relationship. Are, can, are, you, can, are you bold enough to do? You got to be bold to do that. And you have to accept what they say. This, that's their, that's, that's what, how they perceive the situation. You got to respect that and see if there's something that you could have done to change it. If you want to get different results, if it was them, let it be them and keep it moving. Right. I'd really appreciate your honest feedback. Be sure to project an upbeat attitude, right? Don't, don't make it like you're mad because they left you. No, I'm, I sincerely want to know, like, I understand that we're not supposed to be together, but I, I mean, if, you know, could you just, you know, be a kind person and tell me the truth so that I can make some adjustments, tweak what I need to tweak so that I can, so that um, I can be better positioned to have a successful relationship moving forward, right? Listen objectively. You don't, don't be defensive. You are gathering information and be willing to change if there is merit for their input, right? You got to be confident to do those things, right? But they can, they can save you a lot of time. That's for sure. Instead of you trying to figure out what it is that's going on, just ask them. Don't, don't waste a whole bunch of time trying to figure it out. Just ask them. Amen. Amen. Do any of you have any insights? I see um, Sister Lorraine. Hello, hello, hello to you on tonight. Anybody got any input? I don't see anything. So I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, before I dump into the videos, I want to um, make you aware that if you get kicked out for whatever reason, no worries. Go right on over to the website, AbundantLifeMinistries.ChurchTrack.com. And oh, let me finish this dot church track.com. And then you can press on the, um, the flyer and it will take you right behind the scenes. You'll be able to see just like you see here. All right. So make sure you're aware of that. But before we go to the videos, let's, let's see if sister Ishaya has some input input. She's back with us, She's back with us on tonight. <laughs> so did you have any insights about uh, the summary of the chapter? Yes, I did. So she started out saying, talking about boundaries and things like that. And that made me think of a situation that I was going through. But um, but establishing boundaries is very important because once you establish, well, especially if you didn't have a boundary before, but you have to do it in the beginning so that there's not problems occurring later when you figure out, oh, I need these boundaries. But saying no is very important. Because you can't just people please everybody. And so if you know that that situation is not beneficial to you, 
you should be able to say no and be okay with that and not worry about what everybody else is thinking. I think that's important to keep that, you know. And also, being your authentic self is good. It goes with that. But she said that on a different note, so I just wrote it down separately. But being your authentic self is good, too. Yep. Yep. Because otherwise, you're presenting yourself in a way, and then you can have somebody liking this fake version of you. So you're going to just be fake for the rest of your life? That's a horrible way to live. They, that's a horrible way to live. You, you're you mm-hmm. you're leading people on and then they're falling for you. They want to be a friend of friends with you or they want to be in a relationship with you based upon this false reality that you presented to them. That's rude. That's selfish. That's immature. Right. And and, and it's mm-hmm. it really is detrimental to you because eventually you're going to you're going to get tired of playing the, the get playing being fake. Right. That, mm-hmm. that takes work. It takes a yep. lot of work to try to be something or somebody that you're not. And so eventually that's going to get old. And then the real you is going to, when y'all get comfortable, then you're going to start being the real you and they're going to be looking at you sideways. Like, like, who is this? This is, this is not mm-hmm. what I signed up for. This is not who I wanted to be a friend with. This is not who I wanted to be a relationship with. Right. And in some cases you might be stuck if you're married. Right. And so mm-hmm. you just, just, just be you, just be you. And let that person be with you because they want to be with you, not who you're presenting yourself to be. It mm-hmm. makes for a, a much um, healthier relationship. It it, 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 it it takes away a lot of unnecessary frustrations for both yourself and for the other person, right? Mm-hmm. Very good. Some very good insights. All right, so let's go on ahead and get to the first video. Are you burdened with thoughts that tell you that you're unlovable? Do you have a sinking feeling in your stomach when you're alone and your negative thoughts get loud and intrusive? Or are they more like whispers that you just can't shake as they follow you around wherever you go like an ever-present shadow? We made this video to remind you that you are lovable and that sometimes negative thoughts have the power to overtake us and distort our realities. They can make you believe awful things about yourself. To help you overcome these thoughts, here are six things to remember when you feel unlovable. Number one, love blossoms when you start loving yourself. Do you struggle with self-love? Part of the reason you may feel unlovable at times is that you might've forgotten to prioritize loving yourself. Self-love isn't always easy, but it is foundational for believing in yourself, having confidence in your dreams, and accepting your own lovability. You are lovable just as you are, but in order for you to feel that, you have to start celebrating yourself. To practice self-love, try writing down things you love about yourself, moments in your day that made you proud, and people in your life who love you. Number two, your brain is hardwired to latch on to negativity. Have you ever heard the phenomenon called negative bias? It describes the idea that our brain processes negative events differently than positive ones and causes us to amplify them. This can make you focus too much on the negativity around you. You might be recalling negative moments and events and feel unlovable because of that. Remember that your brain is hardwired to focus on those negative things and emotions. Positivity also surrounds you. And the more you bring it to the surface, the easier it will be to accept these negative events and begin to process them in a healthy way. Number three, your flaws do not define you and who you are. We are all only human. As humans, we make mistakes. You might be stuck thinking that your flaws are definitions of your character or that they're on blast for everyone to see and pick apart. But in reality, your flaws allow you a chance to learn and grow into the best version of yourself. When you feel like your flaws are making you unlovable, remember that everyone has flaws and that your flaws make you unique and different. We can all learn from our mistakes or our shortcomings, and we all need time to stretch and grow. You are lovable just as you are, flaws and all. Number four, your mind is a great storyteller. When someone doesn't respond to you right away, do you assume that they don't like you? If so, you are not alone. It turns out that your brain tends to fill in gaps by making up stories that put you in a negative light. You wind up assuming that people are mad at you or that they don't like you. 
Then you'll begin to believe and react to those same assumptions in your mind. The truth is, these stories your brain tells you can mask reality and your worth. And when you believe these stories, it can lead to a downward emotional spiral, making you feel unlovable or faulty. If this happens to you, remember that your brain naturally weaves together elaborate tales. Number five, romantic relationships do not determine your worth or your value. When you've been single for a while, do you start questioning your lovability? Though it's tempting, don't fall into society's trap. There is no written rule that says that being single is a reflection of your lovability or even a negative thing at all. We create negative associations with being single in our minds because society has conditioned us to believe that we're incomplete without a romantic partner. In fact, there are many benefits to being single. If you've been single for a while, you may be feeling flawed, unworthy, or unlovable. In those moments, remember that your worth is not determined by your relationship status. You are lovable and worthy just for being you and for following your passions, regardless of whether or not you have a significant other. And number six, the way people treat you is not a reflection of you. Has anyone ever treated you badly and made you feel like it was your fault? Perhaps it was a family member or a romantic partner. If this is the case, please know that any mistreatment towards you is never your fault. If someone's rude to you, yells at you, or treats you badly in any way, it's natural for your brain to convince yourself that you deserve it as a coping mechanism to make sense of what happened. But remember that nobody, for any reason, is entitled to treat you badly. The trauma that you've experienced is never your fault and absolutely does not mean that you're not lovable, no matter what your brain tries to tell you. We just wanted to remind you that you're wonderful and worthy just the way you are. All right. That was a nice one. And we got some comments here. Sister Talia said, love blossoms when you start to love yourself. Yes. Love blossoms when you start to love yourself. Self-love is vitally important. That was number one. Love yourself. Right? If you don't love yourself, it's going to be hard for you to, ex not it's going to be, not if, if, well, I don't know what I just said, but if you don't love yourself, <laughs> it is going to be difficult for you to believe that someone else would love you, right? And so that is vitally, vitally important. Um, we are not perfect and we all have flaws. Your flaws make you unique, but I always say be unique, be unique, right? We all, every person, no one is perfect. Not one person is perfect. And our flaws is what makes us unique. Absolutely. Um, Sister Twyla says, love yourself first. You can't really love someone fully if you don't first love yourself. Flaws and all, you are still worthy. Everyone has flaws. Just because you're single doesn't mean you are unworthy of having love. God could have this people in a season of not being in a, well, first of all, there's a difference between lonely and being alone, right? We talked about that, the fear of being a fear of loneliness, right? So there's a difference between loneliness and being alone. And God could have you in a season of being alone or loneliness so that you can learn to love yourself. What if that's the reason? Because he wants you to learn to love yourself and not be dependent on love from anyone else other than him. Everything God does is for a reason. He's a very intentional. And so that's why we should always be an optimist. We should work against the natural, how our uh, brain was, how sin has impacted our brain. Right. Because I, I don't believe that our brains were just wired that way. No, they were miswired because of sin. God, that's not God's intention when he created our brain. Sin got in there and, and missed and caused some misfires. And so now that's what's common. There's a big difference. Amen. And so, yeah, that's good. Anything from you, Ishaya? Um, I also noted the you have to love yourself first. But I said it to the point of if you don't love yourself first, then you I mean, if you do love yourself first, then you wouldn't be worried about somebody. Well, also, I'm going I'm to add God, too, because if you understand God's love for you and you also love yourself first, then you wouldn't be worried about somebody else 
that wanted to love exactly you. right that's exactly right if you fully embrace who god created you to be that will be enough and when that becomes enough and you're not dependent on somebody else then he can bring somebody else along at that point but if you're craving love from somebody else you're gonna get into a relationship and it's going to be a mess because you're going to be expecting something from that person that god did not that you that god did not design you're going to be expecting them to make you whole and only god can make you whole you're going to ex be expecting them to determine your worth and that comes from God. God determines your worth. You're going to be seeking things from a spouse that you should be getting from God. And it's unfair to that spouse if you're expecting them to do things that they are incapable of doing because only God can do it. See the setup? It's a setup for failure. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a good thing if God is trying to get all that mess out of you first. So that you, so that when you get, uh, when when he gives you the the, um, when when he sends the the man for you, you'll be healthy, and y'all can just jump in and be on be start on a good foundation and not a rocky one. Amen. That was good. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, no, that was it. I think that was it. Hold on. Oh, I had also said that. Well, she said the way people will treat you is not a reflection of you, but I, I want I added that it was a reflection of them and however they was treated. Because you say hurt people, hurt people, and what was the other one you, we made up? Traumatized made up. people, traumatized yeah, people. That one. So I was just saying I was a reflection because she didn't add it, but I was just saying that's a reflect, reflection of how they are. Not. Yep. So I wrote, I rewrote the, them too as well. So the number one, I wrote, love yourself. And then I emphasize that right, right um, down things that you love about yourself. That's very important. You got to take the time to see yourself the way God does. Write something down every day. Just one thing that you, that you are pleased that you did with in that day. Just start with one thing, but do it every day, right? Number two, your brain leans towards negativity. That's because of the miswiring. That's not God's intentional, the original intent, right? But we need to be aware of that. And then number three, your flaws do not define you. Your flaws do not define you. God does defines you. So what you view as a flaw, God may not. Right? We might not understand why that thing that's that's going on in us is going on and we view it as a flaw. But in reality, it could be not, it could be, it was intentional unless it's you that went in there and did something, right? But sometimes like, for an example, this is one example that I just gave, somebody that's very soft smoking, they could want to be passionate, right? But God designed, may have designed you to be soft spoken so that you can bring peace. Everybody has a different mm -hmm. assignment. So if you see that as a flaw and you don't want to say nothing, because you you, you because um you're soft spoken, then you're you're holding back peace from somebody else. Mm -hmm. So we gotta know that these are that there's a that, that everybody has a different gift, and that doesn't mean you just stick in that one gift and don't be a, be afraid to go outside the box because there could be a time for you to be passionate as well. But but embrace the soft. There could be a. You know, there could be a time for you to be behind the scenes, but there could be time for you to be up front, right? And so you just got to work through all of those. Number four, your mind makes up stories. I see the, what stood out to me in that okay. picture. The girl was making the text and mm -hmm. wasn't getting no response. And just the mind was going, making up all these negative stories. But in reality, the person she was texting was sleep. Snoring away, slobber and all. Did y'all see it? Slobber coming all out of his mouth. So you done made up this whole narrative. Of they don't like me. They mad at me. And in reality, they was just sleep. They can't respond to your text if they're asleep. But that's but the, the, the enemy distorts our, our thinking and puts all this negativity, negativity to tear us down. And that could very well not be the case at all. <laughs> 
So we have to train ourselves to be to notice, to notice, be aware when we are being negative and nip it in the bud and make a choice to be positive. To, to reframe your thoughts. Well, maybe they didn't see the text. Maybe they're in the shower. Maybe they're in the bathroom. Maybe they maybe they forgot their phone. Think positive and make up positive, make up positive excuses instead of making up negative ones. Right? Number five, romantic relationships don't de determine your worth. We talked about that. God could have you in a being by yourself to get you ready for being in a relationship, right? Number six, the way people treat you is a reflection of them. That's what I wrote down, Ishaya. That's not what oh. she emphasized. She emphasized it's not a reflection of you. Yeah. But guess what? The way people treat you, it is a reflection of them. Okay. The way people will treat you is a reflection of them. If they treat you bad, then they probably got some issues. Everything people do, do does has a reason behind it. Hurt people hurt people. Traumatize people traumatize people, right? But don't take on their stuff and make it make it. That's their issue, not your issue. When you're healthy and you're whole and you have high self-esteem, you have you, your your self-worth is in God, your identity is in God, you don't you you don't automatically assume that there's something wrong with you because you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. So there's either a disconnect here or something wrong with you. It maybe you don't realize. And so you're 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 projecting your hurts on me because you got wounds that you didn't heal because you don't realize who you are in God. Right. That's why we have to be aware of all of these different things and how we interact with people um, so that we can minister at all times and all things in all ways. There is a ministry to do at all times and all things in all ways. And it takes self-control, humility, and that's a continuous work in progress. It's a continuous daily work or work in work in progress because nobody is perfect. You could you could not have that. You could you could do it well one day and then you having a bad day and then you don't do it that day. Right? We just got to keep on striving towards perfection. Amen. We should be striving towards perfection though we are not perfect. Amen. Amen. Hello, hello, hello to you. I wish I knew who you were. Go ahead and give StreamYard permission um, to show your beautiful face and name by clicking the link above this video or the link that from yesterday's video, because I would love to know who you are and to acknowledge you properly. But hello to you as well. So glad you are here. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let's see what we got. What is rejection trauma? While rejection trauma is not a formally, you know, diagnosable dynamic in a word, what we're really talking about for many people is the experience of repeated rejection in their childhood. Now, it may have been attempts to be emotionally connected, receiving, you know, feeling like you're being seen and validated and uh, that a parent is emotionally wanting and available and accepting of who you are or they're not. So they can't give you comfort or sympathy or empathy or emotional attention and or support in any way. Or it could be that actual physical rejection or both, which was like, don't hug me, don't kiss me, don't hold my hand, like a true rejection of the child's physical body in terms of comfort and affection and, and emotional and physical safety. And so there's like a distancing that occurs. And what happens with this sort of rejected child syndrome experience is that deep inside, we develop these core beliefs and these, these trauma responses that help us survive that really wasteland of loneliness that we would have experienced. I mean, imagine going through your childhood and not having that. And so many of us are getting this form of rejection through a lack of um, emotional availability, from a lack of emotional safety. But there's an active, you know, whether it's mental or physical, emotional pushing away. It is a pushing away of the child, not just not paying attention, but an intentional like, you don't get this from me. And a child has no other choice but to decide and when they're children that, oh, that must mean there's something wrong with me. And so there's something wrong with me, I think, shows up in the following seven signs. 
Number one, we have deeply negative thoughts and beliefs about what others are thinking about us. And so we are always looking for that and scanning once again, as I talk about hypervigilance so much, but it's like we're looking for any sign of rejection all of the time. And the automatic negative thought is like, you're going to hurt me. You don't care about me. I'm not worthy. You're going to leave me. My needs aren't allowed, whatever it is. Number two, we have a tendency to engage in some form of emotional or physical or both avoidance and or isolating types of behaviors, which also might fall into being overly self-reliant. So we're overly independent, like pseudo-independent. These also can tie in with the classic um, attachment patterns and how we might show up in the world. But we basically use our own distancing to deal with the distancing we received. And it might be, like I'm saying, on the one end from truly being alone a lot and rejecting time with others, it just feels too vulnerable and unsafe. It could be that you are just, you travel the world alone and you're doing everything. You're overly independent. But behind that, it's not just your exploratory independence. It is a response to not getting that. And so your tendency is to distance in your own version in avoidance, isolation or over over self-reliance number three people pleasing and compulsive caretaking now this would fall into the more anxious like the last one i just described that might fall into a, a pattern of more dismissive or avoiding attachment but here because of the rejection we have learned to be hypersensitive to getting others um, to helping others get their needs met so we feel a great sense of value because we think the only way we do have value because we felt so rejected was to never make it about us and to make it about you. And when we're making it about you, it finally does let us feel some form of love. It's the opposite of distancing. Oh, you're, you know, you, I took care of you. I provided for you. You think I'm valuable when I do those things. And so oftentimes we're going above and beyond to deal with these rejecting parents. And that skill or technique we learn is to hyper-focus on others, to deny our own self and as I know I say a million times, it allows us to avoid our own pain, the pain of the, uh, the pain of the rejection, honestly. Number four is our trust issues and fear of vulnerability. And they are basically one and the same, that to be in relationship requires vulnerability and trust. And if you had a parent push you away on, on distance from you in some regard or all of these regards, what have you learned about closeness? A, you don't know much about closeness. What you know is that you've been hurt in a relationship and it doesn't make sense to take the risk and show your true self because first of all, you often don't know who that person is or how to access it and it doesn't feel safe. It actually feels the opposite. It feels threatening because you had that guard up, that wall up, because even though you had no language to say this parent is rejecting me, you felt that rejection in your body. We are warm-blooded mammals who reach out for connection. And however you experience that rejection, it's going to hurt inside your body. And that hurt is going to tie directly to trust issues and vulnerability, which are the demands in most relationships on some level. And then going back to the earlier, like I said, what a great strategy to employ when you feel too vulnerable or being asked to, to go avoid, isolate, or go off on your own. The next one is never feeling good enough and having a difficult sort of sense of self or self-esteem issues. So rejection trauma is really all about saying on some level, you're not worthy. You know, you're, you don't get to have a, a valued sense of self. In fact, you deserve active rejection. And so what else, what other meaning could we make of that? Then if that is, that is because we are bad, there is something defective or wrong about us. The next one is difficulty regulating your emotions, especially when people have emotional demands and expectations. Things like communication, boundary setting, interpreting social cues, making meaning of social cues, having rejection sensitivities, feeling like you're a child, no matter how old you become inside. Like I was saying, there's like a developmental arrest that can occur when you have these difficulties. And so we're stuck in that rejected child's mind and body. And so when it comes to dealing with our feelings, if we were rejected, we would have dealt with a lot of those feelings alone. We would have repressed them, suppressed them. We would have stuffed them. We would have put them every which way we could now and then away from us because it wouldn't be safe. 
And so when people have demands on us, we feel number one, they're going to reject us. So why should I even tell you? But we didn't even get the skills. What we lacked was reciprocity. I hug you, you hug me back. I kiss you, you kiss me back. I tell you I love you, you say it back, right? That is the reciprocity that we never get when we have this kind of trauma. And lastly, we are often living with a deep, profoundly deep sense of loneliness and isolation deep in our soul and in our core. And we feel deeply unknown by everyone. It's like no one can ever really know me and I'm not worth being known. And why? Because of all the things I just said. And so that can keep us living in a lifelong pattern of actual loneliness where we isolate and are avoidant. It can keep us feeling lonely in relationships, even if we try to find ways to be in them. We feel so deeply rejected and misunderstood and alone inside. And that can be a very hopeless, difficult place to be until you become aware of maybe why you feel so other than, so different than. So how do you work on this? Of course, things like trauma-focused therapies, reparenting work, inner child work, which I know isn't always easy, learning to develop the skills of self-compassion, maybe developing social skills, like real skill practice on how to communicate, how to be in social dynamics, how to interpret social cues, to understand and really become aware of this sort of like scanner for rejection that you enter every situation, every relationship, looking for signs of rejection. And then looking at how you reinforce those things you do. So maybe you say you want connection, but you never take take risks and go try to make connections because it's too scary. And so you avoid things, you avoid, you know, intimacy, vulnerability, and that keeps you stuck in this reinforcing pattern. And then doing things like naturally trying to slowly let people into your life to build connection, which is terrifying when your underlying belief system is that people will reject you, that you're not worth seeing and your needs don't matter. And of course, something like this could manifest in something like a borderline disorder, trauma-based disorders. A lot of these things are so related to what we did not receive in childhood and how that creates trauma in our bodies, in our stories, and in our lives. And so if this is you, please know that there are places to begin healing, but acknowledging it and trying to just honor that you know, in a childhood like that, all you could barely do was survive it. And you did do that. But that being the standard, just surviving is not an easy way to go through life. And you deserve more than that. So, thank you for being here. Please stay safe and well. And I'll see you soon. Take care. All right. How about you? What did you, what, oh, wait, let's see. You've got something here. Um, Sister Teresa says, you are going to be rejected sometimes, another in, sometime or another in your life. So you have to learn from it some way or another. I'm thinking that says, right. Everybody, you know what? I was, I don't, listening to some of these videos, um, something that they pointed out, it's it, because when, when they first said it, it, took me back because it said everybody has been it's subject, um, rejected at some point in their life. Right. And I'm big on absolute, not using absolutes. So when they said, um, everybody, I'm like, and I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about that. And so then they pointed out that even God and Jesus were, um, rejected. And when they said that, I was like, yep, <laughs> Because if God and Jesus were rejected, certainly you would be, right? People reject God every day. They don't want nothing to do with God. People rejected Jesus. He was walking this earth and they didn't want nothing to do with him. So if they rejected God and Jesus, of course, why wouldn't you be rejected, right? So yeah, everybody has been rejected in some way or another at some point in their life. That's something to take in. Yep. All right. Uh oh, I didn't mean to take her off. I meant to unmute. Um, what are your uh, thoughts? You have to unmute yourself. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The first one was 
deeply negative thoughts and beliefs. Wait, hold on. I must have wrote that wrong. You have deeply negative thoughts and beliefs on what other people think about you? I think yeah, that's that was, what that's okay. That was a sign, yeah. Okay, I wrote that down because I had something to do with the other video that you had played about how we are rejected. You think that everybody, I don't, I don't want to say like that, but when you're rejected, your mind makes up stories in your head. Right. And so you have negative thoughts about every situation. I'll say it like that. Mm-hmm. So that was the first one I wrote. Um, people pleasing and compulsive caretaking. That's the third one. I wrote that one down because that's the polar opposite because there can be, you know, two, two to things. So that was the polar opposite. So if you're for you, if you feel rejected, then you feel like you need to people please, and that you need to say yes, 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 all the time because your your feelings or whatever is not worth the attention. So you just put it on them to begin with. Yep. So that one. I think that was it. Oh no. Yeah, no, that's it. My bad. Sorry. Yep. So I wrote down um, negative thoughts of people's perception of you. You automatically think negatively about what other how other people view you. I wrote down we avoid relationships and isolate, becoming overly independent, overly independent. I can do a, 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 a superwoman attitude. That's that's not of God. God did not design us to be superwomen. That's a distraction and distortion from the enemy. God did not design us to be a superwoman. We cannot do everything. We're not supposed to do everything, right? And God made us for relationship, relationship with him first and foremost, but also relationship with other people. And all, there's all kinds of different relationships, family relationships. We start out in a family. Those are relationships that should teach us how to build on friendships, that should teach us how to build on a spouse, right? And so we're not supposed to do everything. And when we think that we can, we isolate ourselves. And when we think that we can, we really make our, we're, we're, we're saying that we are God, but people don't want to look at it that way because the only one that can do everything is God. That's it. So if you think that you can do everything, well, then you think you're God and that's a problem. You need help. <laughs> God did not design you to do everything. Biblically, men have a role and women have a role. I don't care how feminist you are and whether or not you want to believe it. That's what the Bible says. Amen? If you're talking, Ishaya, we can't hear you. You just muted me. No, I didn't. Oh. <laughs> All right. And then I wrote down um, three, people pleasing and overly compensating it, it, uh, and enabling that is a big big deal i think they worded it what did you say as oh, caretaking she said something about caretaking overly caretaking or something Com compulsive caretaking compulsive ter caretaking right mm -hmm. our job is to train our children to become productive adults if you overly caretake and you do everything for them they grow up to be adults who don't know how to do anything for themselves they call you to make an appointment to go to the doctors. Ma, can you make a doctor's appointment for you? Uh, no, you a grown woman. No, you're in, you're you're you are you you're enabling them to not mature, and that's a problem. That's not God's design. You're 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 making up your own rules for parenting. That's not what a parent is supposed to do. You're supposed to train them up not do everything for them train them that means show them how to do it so we and, and uh, overly caretaking that that causes enabling overly compensating you feel bad so you give them everything they want then they grow up to be adults who think that they can have anything that they want that's not how the world works that's why they can't keep a job because they don't want to submit to nobody's authority they don't want to do what the boss they do they want to tell the boss what to do because they think they can do whatever they want, however they want it, whenever they want to do it. You, you, you are, you are, you are, you're, that's not beneficial for them. We have to be, we got to hold our children accountable. 
That's our job is to teach them. If they're not responsible enough to drive the car, they don't get the car. If they're not responsible enough to have a job, they don't get to have a job. You can't be trusted out my sight right now. So we're going to have to still keep working until I can trust you to go to work and be around other people and act like you got some home training. If they're not responsible enough to go out with their friends yet, then, then they don't get to go. It don't matter how old they are. I don't care if they're 13, 16, however old they are. If you have not proven to be responsible enough to do what the average 16, 17, 18... 14 year old should do, you don't get to do it until you prove that you're you're ready and able to do that. Because if you put things on your children that they're not ready for, you're not, you're setting them up for failure. Right? Um, I put not vulnerable because they're they're not vulnerable because of lack of trust. Right? A relationship requires vulnerability. We are supposed to your your husband and your 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 um Adam and Eve they saw each other naked without clothes on. That's the most vulnerable state that you can ever be in because you see every flaw and imperfection, right? And so if you're not able to be vulnerable because you lack trust, that's a problem. Right. Number five, low self-esteem and feeling of unworthiness. You feel unworthy because you have low self-esteem. Number six, difficulty with communication. You're stuck feeling like the rejected child who, who can't, who just got to shut up and take it. Right. Number seven, lonely and invisible. You feel lonely and invisible. And then I wrote down another one. You want you want connection, but you don't take the steps to make them. Right. And so how do you fix that? You fix that with inner child work and you move from surviving to living the abundant life Christ offers. Many people are stuck. Whatever age they were traumatized are at. If you was traumatized at five, you can be 65 and still and still in your in, in your mind and in your heart. You're the five year old little girl that was violated and you're stuck there. If you were 20 and you now you're 80, you can be the 20 year old that you're stuck there in that unhealthy 20 year old and never mature and to be the 80 year old. Right. And so we have to move from survival mode to beginning to live the abundant life that Christ offers. Amen. 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 Glory to God. All right. Let's see what the next one is. Hi, my name is Thais Gibson, and I'm the creator of the Personal Development School. This is your daily breakthrough video. And in this video, I want to talk to you a little bit about some major cognitive distortions that can take place um, and just negative patterns of thinking that we can use reframes for. And I find that we talk so much about all these ideas on this channel and like patterns and things to be aware of. And I think it would be maybe really useful for some of you guys, because I always want to be as, you know, helpful as possible to everybody who's here to learn and grow and heal. Um, but I was thinking, you know, maybe some specific cognitive reframes for specific things that you might find yourself stuck on would be very beneficial. So that is what this video is going to cover. Now, we're gonna cover major situations. We're gonna cover things like when you feel rejected, we're gonna cover things like when you feel like you're failing, um, when you make a mistake, and when you're feeling afraid of being abandoned. So I'm gonna give you very specific cognitive reframes for these things. And I want you to keep in mind that our mind can sort of play tricks on us when it's especially trying to gain certainty. And it can sort of pigeonhole us into certain patterns of thought or it can derive patterns of thought from its own subconscious comfort zone based on like past experiences that are essentially being projected onto like almost like overlaid onto our current reality. An example of this could be if you saw your parents go through a bad divorce, maybe you grow up and you like expect relationships to fail, right? And so when you see a change in a pattern, your mind naturally jumps to an assumption like, oh my goodness, this relationship's on its way out, it's broken, it's gonna fail. And so the mind likes to do that essentially. It likes to pull from past experiences, experiences, project onto current ones, 
and essentially assume at a subconscious level that these are the things that are going to take place. Now, it doesn't do this to hurt you. It does this literally to try to protect you um, and to prepare you for worst case scenarios. And so while it's well-intentioned, it sometimes can be counterproductive. And a lot of the times when these things go unchecked, they almost can create self-fulfilling prophecies because then we're constantly like, either accusing somebody or um, holding on too tight or pushing somebody away because we assume they're going to hurt us or we sort of have these coping mechanisms to react to those overlays that can actually create problems in a relationship dynamic or in the workplace or with a friendship or, you know, based on the context of the situation you're experiencing. So um, just some clear cognitive distortions that that sort of fall under these categories. and And um, cognitive distortions are very interesting when you get into them, but some of them are things like jumping to conclusions or mind reading is a form of cognitive distortion. Um, and it's essentially just that it's this overlaying or like assuming things um, about somebody else and their intentions or about their actions that usually has more to do with us than necessarily to do with them. Um, things like disqualifying the positive. So when we sort of um, get into a position where we reject positive experiences instead of embracing them. Um, so maybe if you get a positive response in the workplace, for example, from your boss, you go, oh, it's only because they're trying to be nice, right? So sort of this disqualification, there's many different forms of cognitive distortions. But if you wanna do a deeper dive into that, um, I have an entire anxiety course that covers cognitive distortions and how to actually reprogram these things at the subconscious level. And it is our overcoming anxiety course. So you could check that out if you wanted to for free by clicking the link below. Um, but basically all these different things, these different forms of cognitive distortion can create patterns of thinking. And what I'm gonna break down for you is like specific ones and specific reminders you can use to pull yourself out of that and also step into more solution-oriented thinking and sometimes more accurate thinking um, in a specific circumstance. So let's just say, for example, one of our first cognitive reframes or cognitive distortions that we would need a cognitive reframe to use would be somebody doesn't call you back. It could be a friend, a family member, it could be a romantic partner, it could be somebody you're dating and you start thinking thoughts about how you're not good enough or how you did something wrong and they're upset with you. These are two very common, um, specific cognitive distortions that I'll see people sort of come up with. And let's say it's somebody you're dating. You know, an example here of a cognitive reframe could be maybe we're not a match. Like, and I'm saying they never called you back at all, right? Maybe we're not a match. And I deserve somebody who wants to put energy into this relationship as well. And that would put you into more of a solution-oriented mindset. And it's a good way of reframing the situation so you don't go down the thought rabbit hole of negative spiraling and of making it mean something you really can't know, right? Like it, a lot of times it's like we take things and we go, oh, it's because I'm not good enough. Chances are like somebody's on a different page in terms of their needs, their belief patterns, their programming, their own fears, what they're looking for in their life. Like there's so many different reasons, but isn't it interesting that our mind goes there first or many people's minds go there first. Now, let's say instead that we go down the other pathway and that somebody isn't calling you back and you start assuming they're upset with you or angry with you. Um, a great cognitive reframe or different way of approaching this would be to think something like, you know, I've been showing up as, as a friend very well. You can evaluate and check in. Um, and if it's if there's something they need to communicate to me about, I'm happy to listen and it's their responsibility to do. And so it's just a reminder that like, hey, if there's a problem that somebody has and if you can't think of what it might be, that onus actually falls on the other person to communicate. And when you evaluate and check in and see no, 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 my behavior has been good and I've been doing a good job of being a friend or a family member or whatever it might be, then it's it's much more difficult for you to go down that that rabbit hole of spiraling and assuming at a subconscious level that you did something wrong, somebody's upset with you and putting yourself in that position. And just to be clear, people who tend to think of that are people who usually went through a lot of punishment um, in childhood and, and felt belittled or small or things like that, not because parents are bad in, in those situations, but just because of the parenting strategies that were used and the impact they actually have on the subconscious mind, even though parents are probably trying to do the best thing at the time. Um, the next one is I didn't get the job and I'm a failure. And a much healthier cognitive reframe would be something like, I'll find something that's the perfect fit for me. And I trust myself to be able to show up and continuously put the effort in until I do. So again, just like solution oriented, you see in this. Um, another big one is I hate, I made a huge mistake and everyone is judging me. Okay, so maybe you're at work, you mess something up, something takes place, 
And a great reframe, especially as it relates to mistakes, is it is normal to make mistakes and I will be accountable. And I can always ask other people for support too. And really the idea behind that is to normalize mistakes because guess what? They're gonna happen your entire life <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. You're a human. It's how things go. And the best way to always respond to mistakes is just to literally um, look at them, be accountable and create strategies for the solution and to take some ownership and learn from the experience. That's the best thing we can do. The next one is I am going to be abandoned because something changed. Okay. Like the pattern changed. They are texting me less, whatever it might be. And a great reframe, reframe and reminder for this is it is normal for relationships to have ebbs and flows. And if there's a challenge, I can talk about it or state my needs and ask for reassurance. Okay. And just, again, these reminders that put you into a solution oriented mindset and focus. Again, if you want to do a much deeper dive, if you find you have a lot of cognitive distortions, um, whether it's, you know, magnifying um, the big things, all or nothing thinking, um, disqualifying the positive, jumping to conclusions, mind reading, all these different things. Um, a great course that you can check out for free and download all the worksheets and all that stuff is um, our Overcoming Anxiety course. It targets anxiety literally at the subconscious level by reprogramming cognitive distortions, helping you find their source, finding ways to repattern them. So you can check those out for sure. Um, and hopefully this all makes sense to you. All right. I'm going to unmute you, Ishaya. You were tapping on the desk or something. That's why I muted you. <laughs> but go ahead. Anything stand out to you? Um, she also used the same example as the first one when they talk about the text messages. When mm -hmm. somebody when somebody don't answer you or whatever, and you think that they got a problem, mm -hmm. but if they got a problem, that's something that they need to tell you that they got a problem about, and mm -hmm. it's not something you need to beat yourself down about is something that they need to communicate and so if they don't want to communicate it then it is what it is and you gotta keep pushing yeah yep yep all right i wrote down um don't project your failures in the past to the to the future don't automatically think because something was negative in the past that it's going to be negative in the future i wrote down um negative assumptions and jumping to conclusions right that's something that we have to need to be more aware of so that we can stop doing and then disqualifying positive outcomes automatically you know you you, you if you don't even think that it could be somebody's reaching out to you because they just want to show you that they appreciate you you just automatically think they're doing it because they want something from you right they're just disqualifying the fact that somebody could really have pure thoughts and pure motives behind what it is that they're doing and then i put intentionally choosing optimism instead of pessimism right we have to we have to just make a a, a choice to reframe our minds to think in a positive way instead of in a negative way all right. I don't say any comments, so we're going to go to the next video. We are going to talk about something today that is every person's issue. Yeah. Um, the, in one way or another, you have all, we have all experienced rejection in our life. And so that's something that we want to talk about. We want to encourage people. We want to talk about how to reject the pain that rejection mm -hmm. wants to bring in mm -hmm. our lives. So let, let me just start. Um, how would you guys describe anybody? How would you describe what rejection does in your heart? Like, what does it feel like? What does it do to you? Because the, the implications of it are huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can start by yeah. saying, what it felt like to me recently was <laughs> to my heart. Uh, this is how I described it. I just recently went through divorce. Um, and what I told people, I was like, how do you feel? Well, I was like, well, it feels like he literally cut my chest open, grabbed my heart and scraped it against burning asphalt and then tried wow. to put it back yeah. inside. Like, seriously, that's the pain wow. that that rejection felt like for me because it was so unexpected and so very painful. So and I know it, it a little, that was a little graphic, but that's how I feel. No, yeah. I get it because it can be that emotional and, and the physical pain as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it'll just rack your whole body. Yeah, it? yeah, it just, it, it, I could physically feel pain. Like, yeah. Well, God has created us for acceptance. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's our godly DNA. We yeah. all want to be accepted. And yeah. so when you're not accepted, it's always painful. And unless you really learn who you are in Christ, which we'll talk about today, you begin to do whatever you think you need to do to be accepted, mm -hmm. which if you're not careful, you end up with everybody else running your life yeah. and you having no life because you're not making any of your own decisions. You're doing whatever you think they want you to do right. mm -hmm. so they will like you and be pleased with you. Yeah. yeah. This drive to avoid rejection is huge. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. is powerful. Like most of us will do anything to avoid rejection. Don't you think, Chris, have you had that experience uh, in listen, your life? I, I think rejection is what I would call my Achilles heel. And I mm. think, you know, um, right, the fact how I think how I was conceived, the fact that I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted when I was born, there was that mm. rejection. Um, and I'm 55 this year. And just I, I recently, you know, I, God has done such a great healing work in my life. But um, a couple of years ago, I experienced this betrayal from a friend that I just wasn't, you know, David, I was thinking this, Joyce, um, when we were telling this story yesterday, that the psalmist said, um, it would have been okay if it was my enemy that was against me but when it was my friend mm, yeah, that I went yeah. to the house of the Lord with yeah, yeah. and um that that psalm has given me great solace because otherwise I would have thought why did it impact me but it's almost like it triggered such a deep level of rejection again going mm -hmm, yeah. um I thought I've worked through a lot of this and I have, and I knew to go to the word, but that visceral pain, I, there was this one night that I felt like this visceral pain. And then in that moment, the Holy Spirit was like, Christine, I'm healing an even deeper level right, so from good. right when I was in my mother's womb and yeah. obviously mm -hmm. conceived, you know, it, however God meant it to happen, but it was, yeah, wasn't right. planned in obviously my biological mother and father's um plan and so the thing is that rejection is like an achilles heel so you can have visceral reactions and i think if i hadn't learned um and again i'm going to say your teaching probably has done more in my life to bring healing uh the root of rejection like mm -hmm. I, if i read that a hundred times i'm probably not even exaggerating because mm -hmm. it i have had to revisit it and revisit mm -hmm. it uh, because if the enemy could have short circuited my purpose in any way over these last 30 years it wow. would be over that issue well let's stop. start there so yeah. we're we're going to start with a a quick clip from Joyce talking about this rejection and the root of it and what it does in our lives and then we'll all come back and talk about it a lot more take a listen when you are a rejection based person or you're afraid of rejection if everybody doesn't agree with you you feel rejected and so if Dave and I were trying to have a conversation, if he didn't agree with me, then I didn't know how to separate who I was from my opinion. And so I had to learn that just because he disagreed with my opinion didn't mean he was rejecting me. He could reject my opinion and still love me. And that was such a major thing to me. So maybe you need to think about that. If you can't seem to talk to people or a certain person without blowing up in anger all the time, then ask God to help you get to the root of it and maybe ask God, do I have, a, how, you know, how do I feel when somebody disagrees with me? Do I feel insulted? Do I feel like they think I'm stupid? Do I feel like they don't respect me? Do I feel like I'm being rejected? And learn how to be a person in Christ who is loved and valued and separate that from what you think and what you do and all those other more exterior things. Does anybody in the building think that maybe you're still dealing with a little root of rejection in your life? That was a lot of people, but you know, if you stick around, we'll have something for everybody. Roots, where there's rotten fruit, there's a rotten root <laughs> somewhere along the line. And sometimes you got to go before the Lord and say, I don't care if you have to completely tear my life apart. I want to get to the bottom, to the root of why I'm angry, why I get so angry. Why do I get mad every time I don't get my way? 
Why are my emotions out of control? Why do I waste so many days in self-pity? Amen? So everyone is saying, <laughs> oh, I don't want to do yeah. that. I don't want to go there. Yeah. Why did she say that? <laughs> but you're so right. I mean, if we don't allow the, the pain of dredging some things up, then the fruit is going to keep coming out the way we don't want it to. I asked the Lord one time why it hurts so bad to get well. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, because it's like you get hurt getting all messed up. And so why yeah. is it when you want to get well yeah. that it hurts so bad? And he taught me what he called doorways of pain. You know, like when my father abused me, I went through a doorway of pain. So I got a little deeper into bondage when my mother mm -hmm. didn't help me when she abandoned me. And that was like another doorway of pain. And so you have to confront each one of those things. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh. You know, rather that you just confronting it in your your mind with you and God or but usually in order to get us to confront things, God will have to lovingly put together a situation. Wow. Oh <laughs> yeah. You no. know, like mm. you had this situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was something mm -hmm. in there that God wanted to come out that would eventually make you freer. Right, she, but really you really killed me in the process. Yeah, yeah. well, it did. Yeah. And that's what it literally it feels like. did. Yeah. You know, I said one time something I was going through something with Dave when I was trying to learn how to be a submissive wife. <laughs> I, I, I love so it. I, I have so learned that now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, I said, "Oh God, this is killing me," and he said, "That's exactly right." <laughs> you know, we're we are supposed to die to self. Yeah, but. God's got this little toolbox that he uses yeah. and it is all in love. It's ultimately to set us free. Yeah. But I don't I don't think you can get over pain without going through some pain yeah. to confront it and a lot of people don't understand that. I think one of the big mistakes that people make and this relates to what you're saying is we always equate pain as being bad. Yeah. Mm. And it's not. Right. You know, many times it's an act of love. Now, God doesn't make people mean so they'll hurt us. Right. But he will use them. Yeah. To make you better. Right. So that's why, as stupid as it sounds, I can say hmm. now I'm not really sorry that I was sexually abused by my dad. Because it's made me who I am. Yeah. And so I realize now, I mean, I prayed for my dad to die. I prayed for my mother to leave him. Yeah. I mean, I prayed for God to get me out of that situation. And of course, I had to come to the point of saying, well, why didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know why you could have, yes. you know, why do you let somebody that mean live that long and hurt that many people? Yeah. You know, well, God didn't get me out of it. But actually, he did something greater. He brought me through it. Yeah. Right. yeah. And a strong person that could do what I've done all these years. And I think what I've, I've realized, even with my own kids, we, I had a hard time letting my kids suffer. Right. Because I went through so much. And so... I'm very guilty of having delivered them from things that I should have backed off and let them go sure. through. Right. Yeah. Sure. Wow. And we think love is to always deliver people from anything that hurts, but it really, right. It's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I heard, a, I was listening to a preacher this morning and he said, if you love me and you see me, sliding in the wrong direction and you don't get in my face and confront me, then you do not love me. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, you know, we have to, we have to be willing sometimes to let people go through things or they'll never get free. We just keep enabling them to yeah. do the same thing over and over and over. Right. So all, the thing is, I think in answer to your question, God, why do you let this happen? Why do you let this happen? All pain is not bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some of the pain that you went through, even in situations that I'm aware of, that yes. I went through similar situations and, you know, we think, God, why are, 
why after what I went through as a kid, why are you letting this happen to me now? But like you said before, we're trying to get something from those people that God, only God can give us. And so I remember a situation and this, to me, this explains it. a woman that used to come to my meetings, somebody told me that she was really hurt because I never spoke to her. And I went to God and I said, I would, I don't want to hurt her. Yeah. Why? I don't even remember seeing her. And God said, I didn't, I hid her from you because I didn't want her to get from you what she needed to come to me and get. Ooh, oh, wow. wow. Mm, and yeah, so wow. how many times is God? Yes. You know, we want somebody do this for me. Be nice to me. Tell me what to do. Show me what to do. And God's saying, mm. no, nope, they're going to have to go through this. In order That's to powerful. get it from me. Yeah. So we're going a little deep here. This I don't, is know. Good I don't know how many people are losing us or staying with us, but oh no, it's, this is um, such good stuff. No, you gotta deep. go deep to fix this. Yeah. You know, you have to go deep to pull those roots of rejection yeah. out. And like yeah. Chris said, you have to know. I mean that you know that you know that God is good. Yeah. And that He loves you. Mm -hmm. And I trust Him, and He's not gonna let anything happen to me. That is going to ultimately be to my detriment. I'm I may hurt and go through some things, but if he's allowing that, it's for the purpose of getting to something in my life that I am totally blind to. Right. That he wants wow. to get in there and heal yeah. and make well. Amen. So she she said a whole lot. She went deep. Amen. Anything stand out to you? Yes. Um, so I'll go, I'll just go straight to what I was gonna say. So she just said the person who God had hid the hid her from seeing so that she would not try and get what she needed from her, but from God was really good because I I, I saw two situations. Well, the first one was with this one person I was watching where she idolized. I know this might sound weird, but she idolized her Bible. What did she idolize? I mean, what did she like look to God? Like the Bible was what she prioritized, but she wasn't worried about the word or nothing in it. It was just the physical Bible and she wasn't worried about God. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds weird because of the Bible, but God had literally had her give the Bible to somebody else so that she's not idolizing the Bible, but idolizing the word. That was in the Bible, so I thought that was good. And also, well, the before, one you go to, before you go move okay. on, the, the the Bible says that people worship the creation more than they worship the Creator. Yeah. That's in the Bible, yeah. right? So, mm -hmm. so she's worshiping the Bible more than she worships the the God of the Bible. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't sound crazy when you know the word, <laughs> yeah. right? Go ahead. And then the one pastor that I was watching, um, he said it was. Um, Pastor Rich, but he has said that some people was coming to him to get what they needed and not God. So he would like, and this was a rejection. He wasn't rejecting them, but he was trying to get them to see that it's not me, it's God. It was the power of God working through him. So that was another thing. It's not rejection. It's just that you don't need, you need to look to the right, you're not looking to the right person because right. it's not him. It's God. So that we was have that. to be intentional as God is using us. You know, as God is using us, we, we we have to be very intentional to make sure we always point back to God. Mm -hmm. We always give the glory back to God. It's OK for people to acknowledge the things that you have done for them. But you, the person they're acknowledging, need to then acknowledge that it was God who worked through me. Right. Mm -hmm. Because everything we do and say should always point back to God. Yeah. Um, I think we have some things here. Let's go ahead. Um I don't know where it starts. I, know. Oh, it starts I, was trying, I was trying to see is was this one that we cover this one. Sister Teresa said when she walked when she talked about pain, saying you have to go through pain in order to find out how to get through it by calling on God and help you and show you how to get through it. Yep. Yep. I got that one wrote right down. You you um you you can't get over pain without going through pain. That's what mm -hmm. I wrote down. Yep. 
That was a good one. That was a good one. Um, Sister Twyla says, just because you reject my opinion doesn't mean you don't love me. We can agree mm -hmm. to disagree and still part in love and peace. That is, yes. People with low self-esteem, people who um, uh, who suffer from rejection, they think that if you reject what they say, that you reject them. No, I'm not rejecting you i'm just re i just re rejected your <laughs> your opinion like i don't agree with your opinion but that doesn't mean that i am rejecting you i still love you i just don't agree with you we can agree to disagree mm -hmm. keep on loving each other right but you, it, it's it's sad because you know you can be aware of different things that issues that people have and you can point it out to them and when they don't see it they don't see it so they're going to deny it even if you make it clear to them you you explain it all if they don't want to see it sometimes they can't see it but a lot of times they don't want to see it and there's nothing we can't we can't remove people's spiritual blinders only god can do that we can just acknowledge it and pray for it. we can acknowledge it bring it to their attention and then pray about it be, pray that God would open their eyes to be able to see that a lot of these behaviors that are going on is because there's some root issues there that you're not acknowledging and the symptoms are never going to go away until you take care of the root. Right. And so that this is one of those symptoms. Yep. That's a good one. Um, she said a lot of stuff. She said a lot of good stuff. She said a lot of deep stuff. Amen. She started, she said a lot of stuff that can help some people get healed if they choose to. Amen. Some of the things I wrote down, I put um, when you don't have your identity in Christ, other people will run your life. Whew. That's a that's a not a good place to be. Right. God is the one that's supposed to be running your life. Sometimes that other person is you trying to run your life. And sometimes that other per person is other people trying to run their life. But anybody running your life other than God is not a good thing. Right. I wrote rejection from the womb is a real thing. Rejection in the womb is a real thing. Um, the fetus can feel that from their mother. The fetus can feel that uh, rejection from their mother come out with attachment disorders and come out with attachments with orders. One sign is they're very, 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 very clingy. Very, 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 very clingy, right? Without reason to be, without cause to be. You, 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 you even have, haven't even had a time to nurture them yet right? Or to not nurture them for them to feel rejected. The rejection came in the womb. They felt that through their mother, right? And then they can be, they can reject those, those hurts onto other people. And often the people who, if, who, who are actually trying to help them, but you have mommy issues or daddy issues and you're projecting them off onto the people who are trying to be mommy or daddy, right? And so these are real, real, real things that happen and if you don't understand the cause of the behavior it can cause you to you yourself to be just you know so confused and you're hurt you know when when you don't have to be hurt when you understand what the cause is what is the root of this behavior and then you can pray for the root of the behavior to be healed so that the so that the symptoms will then go away and help you to be able to be able to deal with people who are who are dealing with rejection issues and trauma issues and hurt issues it helps you to be able to know how to deal with them that's why i love psychology and sociology i love psychology and sociology because if you understand why people do the things they do you have more compassion for them you have more compassion for them and you and you develop more a a a a a, a desire to help them and you develop the skills to be able to help them because you understand that it's not them. It's the issues. It's the it's the it's the mind that's that's causing them to do these things. It's not them. Right. You can you can disassociate the behavior from the person. And that's hard to do. Right. But it, it can cause it can it can a lot of frustrations and hurt and pain um, can be solved when you dis when you disconnect the behavior from the person right this it's the same thing as th there's a difference be it's not the it's i hate the sin I, I i don't hate the sinner right i hate the sin i don't hate the person who's doing it 
there's there's a separation between the sin and the person. It's the enemy that's that's luring the sin. This contributed to the sin. It's you know what I'm, you. There's a separation there. You love the you love the sinner, hate the sin is what is what the saying is, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wrote down just because someone rejects your opinion doesn't mean that you're rejecting them. Yep, where um, where there's rotten fruit, there's a rotten root. Mm -hmm. Where there's rotten fruit, there's a rotten root. What she calls the doorways of pain, I call compacted trauma. It's trauma on top of trauma, on top of trauma, on top of trauma, on top of trauma. That affects that that, that begins to affect the, the 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 brain. That affects the makeup of the brain. When you have every time you have a trauma, there's a mental impact for that. So when you have trauma on top of trauma on top, a lot of people with mental disorders. They're rooted in trauma. They're rooted in trauma because every time you have a trauma, it affects the brain. And when you have trauma on top of trauma, on top of trauma, on top of trauma, now you got mental health issues, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Somebody can just be sitting there and they have a thought and then they just go, they just go, but wow. The slightest thing can trigger them because their brain is not working properly. It's traumatized. It's a traumatized brain. And they respond in a traumatic way. Right? Um, what she calls, oh, I've already played that. Um, you can't get over pain without going through pain. I think somebody else said that. Some pain is good pain if it leads to who to you understanding who God created you to be. Some pain is good pain if it leads to you understanding who God created you to be. Sometimes we have to allow our children to go through a pig pen experience situation to realize that they don't have to live that way in the arms of their father. Sometimes it's the pig pen experience. So everybody try to, too many people try to protect their children, right? And I did give examples about not being ready, but there's a difference between a training period and then when they become an adult, right? Your training, your job is to train them for when they become an adult. And and the and, and when they get up in those older years, you have to begin to allow them to enter certain situations so that you can purposely be like, OK, you see how you handle that? This is how you should have handled that. Right. But there still needs to be a slow release for some children. And then when you have an adult. Right now, you sometimes when you have an adult, you're still a parent, but you parent differently. You have to let go. They're an adult now. They're an adult now. So you got to let them make their own mistakes and learn from their own mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes include you experiencing a pig pen experience, right? The prodigal son, he ended up in the pig pen. And it was only when he got to the pig pen that he realized that he didn't have to live that way in his father's house. And he returned back to his father. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. But we as parents, we have to trust that God is going to lead them back. That's why it says train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart. That's a proverb. That's Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Right. And so um, that means that these are the best practices to take. Right. And it doesn't always happen that way because these are the best. It's not like um, it's not like a prerequisite for a blessing. If you do this, I'll do that. If you do this, I'll do that. No, it's not. It's a proverb. It's the book of wisdom. It's wise counsel. If you do this, you're more likely to, to get this. We have to understand that a lot of people end up being mad at God because they'll say, well, I trained up my child in the ways that they would go. But they they did depart. Well, it's a proverb. It's not a it's not a prerequisite to a blessing. Right. So that's why we have to read our word. But a lot of times if you let them go out there and experience that pig pen. They come back. When our children become adults, we pray for them when they're ch when they're children, we train them. When they're adults, we pray for them. We're always going to be a prayer. But our parenting shifts and changes. I don't even know how I got there. The other thing I wrote is you have to go deep to pull up the roots of rejection. 
That was good. You can't, you, some, it's, some stuff is deep, 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 deep wounds. You're not going, you're not going to heal them wounds at a surface level. You got to go deep. And it, you know, if you got a wound and the, you try to, and the doctor try to dig down in that wound, that hurt. That hurts. You touch a wound, you just press on that tissue, it hurts. So you digging in a wound, that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt. But you got to dig deep so you can get to the root of the rejection. When you when you have a um wisdom tooth, what's that called? Is that a wisdom tooth? They take that know. thing, they take that thing out from the root. You look at a wisdom tooth, you be like, "Where in the world was that at?" Like, did the root be this long? But you can't just you can't take off the tip. You got to dig. That's why they sedate you. They give you medicine. Numb the numb it. They numb it all up. Cause they got to dig down in there. They wiggling. You can feel your jaw, your face moving all over the place. And they just wiggling. They got to get deep down there. there Cause it's, I mean, it's it's rooted. It done been in there. It's housed. It's all it's all tight in there. They got to wiggle and go deep and pull it out from the root and you get that root that root is that root is deep amen 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 it is always god's per plan to prosper us it is always god's plan to prosper us we just got to trust the plan amen amen i think this is the last one you said a a, a really strong word that jumped out and that's the word rejection okay. And here you are, you're facing rejection from the one that you should have the most acceptance with your spouse. And you're going through this. I mean, we all face rejection, but not, not at this rate, at this level. How did you sort that? How did you get your identity and your security, your confidence back? I think I'm still working on that. Mm. Um, you know, what's really complicated is... I wrote a book, um, Uninvited, in 2015 that um, was coming out in 2016. And so right after I found out uh, what was going on in my marriage, uh, that was in February of 2016. In March of 2016, my um, rough draft pages from the book, uh, Uninvited, came to me. And... I remember just weeping and asking God, why would you have me write a book on rejection? And now I'm going to have to talk about this book that I've written on rejection. Jeez. And now I'm going to be walking through the worst rejection of my life. Like, why would you allow me to do that? And I, I felt like the Lord was just stirring in my heart. He wasn't doing this to me. He was doing this for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, he had me write the book last year that I would need this year so desperately. I mean, he had me studying rejection. And you said a, a, a really oh. strong word that jumped out Hold and on. that's the word rejection. How did you sort that? How did you get your identity and your security, your confidence back? I think I'm still working on that. Mm. Um, you know, what's really complicated is I wrote a book, um, Uninvited, in 2015 that um, was coming out in 2016. And so right after I found out uh, what was going on in my marriage, uh, that was in February of 2016. In March of 2016, my um, rough draft pages from the book uh, Uninvited came to me. And I remember just weeping and asking God, why would you have me write a book on rejection? And now I'm going to wow. have to talk about this book that I've written on rejection. Jeez. And 
now I'm going to be walking through the worst rejection of my life. Like, why would you allow me to do that? And I, I felt like the Lord was just stirring in my heart. He wasn't doing this to me. He was doing this for me. Wow. You know, he had me write the book last year that I would need this year so desperately. I mean, he had me studying rejection and the biblical response to rejection and God's tenderness to us in our rejection wow. and his compassion for the rejected. He had me studying that for two years. And so he, he wasn't doing this to me. He was entrusting me with this. Wow. And, um, and I, I just remember spreading those pages out weeping, weeping over the words that God had given me. And now that person I pictured that I was writing the book for, it was me. Wow. It was me. And so even in that, the Lord was so tender and so good. But I think rejection is so hard because in human relationships, we don't know what to do when someone's been rejected. If someone dies, we know how to rally around the left behind right. when someone dies, right? We know how to have a marked moment. We know how to celebrate what was and then help that person in grief walk toward what will be. But with rejection, there is no marked moment. There is no celebration of what was. There's just a shattering of what you thought would be. Mm. And it's, it's just so impossibly hard because that other person is still living and breathing. And, and what is the hardest, I think, is when someone dies, at least you know that they didn't want to go away and you didn't want them to go away. But in rejection, that other person may actually be happy to have walked away. Right. And that's what's so hard. Sure. And, and then how do you pick up the pieces and move on when the future you had planned no longer applies because that person's not there. Wow. It's, it's a deep grief. It's a complicated grief. And it's something that um, I think I'm still processing. Absolutely. So you face rejection and uh, you go through physical pain. And, you know, I love the pilgrimage. That's so great that you go see these friends. But then you go back home and still nobody laying next to you a bed. That's right. And to compound that, you know, I went from having a very busy home life and we raised five kids. Well, the last kid left home. And so now I'm facing literally an empty nest. And so it was just, it was so hard. I don't like being alone. I mean, I really don't like being alone. I like having my alone time. Right. But I like for some other human to yeah, be in the vicinity yeah, that sure. if I scream, they will come and help me. Right, 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 right. right. So this was a whole nother level wow. of, um, of lonely and of um, being with the Lord in utter quiet time. Wow. You know, um, I don't think you could have chosen a better title because as you're telling the story, I'm thinking for your life. This is not supposed to go this way. Yeah. This shouldn't happen to you. Maybe one, um, you know, physical pain and you have a surgery, but talk to me about when it feels, you know, the old saying, when it rains, it pours. Okay. How did you continue to um, read the Bible? Did you do that? Um, go to church, um, be around community. How did you continue to go? Do the things that you knew you're supposed to. Even though I don't want to do this stuff, I'm going to do some of these things because I know it's going to eventually bring some health and bring some life. What were some of those things besides the pilgrimage you did? And how did that start to massage some life back into you? You're in the empty nest. Nobody's there. Quiet times. The ice cream's in the freezer. How do you, how do you soar out of that? I'm, I'm just amazed that you're here right now with a book out of your pain. Talk to me. What did you do besides the pilgrimage? Uh, well, I filled my home with praise music. That was really important. Great. I had someone come over and help me figure out the technology side of playing music these days. <laughs> it is ridiculous. Like when I was growing up, we put a cassette tape in, right? <laughs> it was not complicated. Right. Now, it is like from your phone to the wireless speaker to the this, the that, you yeah. know, it was all kind of complicated. <laughs> but um, I had someone come over and um, 
I knew I had to fill the quietness with something. Right. Um, Because every void demands to be filled. And it's our choice what we fill it with. Mm. And so I listened to so many sermons. I mean, I even had a TV installed where my bathtub was. And someone said, that's weird. You're like watching preachers as you're in the bath. I'm like, they can't see me. Like, it's my problem. (laughs) (laughs) I'm telling you, I filled my space up with truth. Um, wow. And then there were days that the space was filled with tears, sure. and I, I didn't, I didn't want to go to church sometimes, and I, I didn't want to call a friend. You know, it's a messy process. I mean, we're we're human, sure. you know. But one thing, as I as I was reading the Bible, I asked the Lord to give me some spiritual orientation with the Bible. Mm. And do you know the first two chapters of the Bible deal with the perfection? of the way God designed things to be. That, that it, it perfection, when he created this world in Genesis one and two, we get to see the beauty of how it was supposed to be. And then the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, perfection returns. Wow. Garden of Eden returns. There will be no more death, no more crying, no more tears, right? But all those chapters between the first two and the last two, there is no perfection. Right. And I had to make peace with that reality because I think I expected a perfection on this side of eternity that is not possible besides my relationship with God. But you know what? Walking through this journey, I am so thankful that lesser loves can never satisfy me. Wow. I'm so thankful that lesser loves will always disappoint us because my heart now knows where to turn to to get that deep satisfaction. And the gift that that's given me is tremendous Mm. because I can now look at you as a human and not expect a perfection from you that would crush us in the weight of a relationship. Mm. I can look at my husband now and I cannot expect perfection from him. No husband was ever supposed to be or carry the weight of trying to be my God, Right. right? Only God is supposed to do that. And so... You know, I learned a lot. I filled that void with an atmosphere of learning, and I needed to learn some things. Absolutely. Well, I think, you know, the void, most of us fall into the temptation of filling it with things that are immediate, substance, uh, relationship. And if you can, it's a big if, if you can bring yourself to filling it with healthy things. You know, as you were talking, I was thinking of that scripture, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God, whether it's a bathtub or in the living room when you figure out the speaker or in your car. I know for me, when I faced the hardest times in my life, I felt the most tempted yep. to fill it with the wrong things. Did you sense some of that pulling? Absolutely. Because we don't, we don't like to feel pain. We are conditioned right. to numb the pain. Like if we have a headache, we take Advil, right? I mean, if we're hurting, we go to the doctor and say, take away the pain, yeah. right? If um, emotionally we're hurting, you know, we want a quick fix for yeah. that. So for me, um, there were lots of, of opportunities for me to numb the pain, for sure. But I also knew that to stay in a place of just numbing the pain would never it would ne- I would never deal with the pain. And sure. if I never dealt with the pain, then I could never heal from the pain. The only way to get to healing is get to the dealing, right? Ooh. So you got to say deal it again with for it. the people in the back. Hold on. <laughs> you can't just drop. She drops these bars like it's nothing. And just, and I don't want to take my phone and write it down, but I don't, they don't let me have my phone up here. <laughs> say it again. My God, would say that one more time. Well, the only way to get to the healing is to get to the dealing. Like Oof. you've got to deal with the pain if you're ever going to heal the pain. And dealing with it is no fun, trust no. me. And numbing it seems like the better choice at the time. Right. Um, and there's no shortage of things to numb our pain with, right? There, You know? We, we have a million distractions that sure. are eager to help us, but those distractions will never, never help us in the long term. So true. They only give us some relief in the short term. So true. You are so insightful. She had a lot. She had a lot of good stuff too. And I think Ishaya, you're about to dip out. Oh, so. 
Yeah, so come on up here and I'll um, start talking here. Oh man, what was I about to say? What was that last thing she said? Oh man, that was good and I forgot what she said. <laughs> hmm. Anybody remember that very last thing she said? Wow. Hopefully Ishaya wrote it down because that was a good one. But anyway, so what I wrote, oh, let me take her off the screen here. So what I wrote down is um, God isn't doing this to you. He's doing this for you. God isn't doing this to you. He's doing this for you. See the, see the change in thought process? That's a big change in thought process. I wrote down God is... In, God is entrusting you to this. That's a big change in thought process that he's entrusting you with this, right? I wrote down every void demands to be filled. We determine what we fill it with. And I, when, I, when she said that, it made me think about how I always say about, and I said it one of these other nights about how, you know, if you, um, have the TV on all the time because you're you you you're you're not comfortable in silence. You know that's an issue, and I wanted to clarify here because that's a good thing she said. When you have a TV on, just because you're uncomfortable in silence, I can scoot over. Just because you're uncomfortable in silence, you're you're using that as whitewash noise, right? That's whitewash noise. You're not actually listening to it. You're, you're not actually being attentive to it. It's just whitewash noise because you don't want to hear the silence. The silence is painful. The silence is uncomfortable. But that's completely different than playing. And I've been saying this for, since day one. Saturate your atmosphere with praise and worship. But also the word of God. Sat, fill the void with praise and worship and with um, the word of God. And let that just play. I remember when my when my children were young, we had I don't know where it is. I got it right from the Dollar Tree, um, the New Testament. I put that thing in and just played it 24 seven because I was getting the word in them. I just played it 24 seven because I was getting the, I was allowing the word to saturate the atmosphere so that it could get into my children. Right. And so what we need to fill the void with is godly things, not just nonsense. You playing the TV. And it's sin, 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 sin. You're not paying attention to it. It's whitewashed to you, but it's saturating your home. Woo. But it's saturating your home. You have to guard. You have to be careful. Your home is supposed to be a sanctuary of peace. But you bring it in sin every time you turn that TV on and just let it play. Just let it play 24-7. Just let garbage music play 24-7. No, on that phone, watching garbage stuff on the phone 24 seven. No, you have to be very, very intentional, right? So you fill the void with the word of God, praise and worship music and literally the word of God. Just saturate your home with it, right? I wrote down faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. Wrote down lesser love will never satisfy you like the love of God can. Lesser love. That means any uh, any love other than God is lesser love. Any God other than God, any love other than God's love is lesser love. Whew. I wrote down she filled her void with an atmosphere of learning. She filled her void with an atmosphere of learning. We don't know what we don't know until we know it. If all you know is dysfunction. You don't know what health is, right? You don't know what you don't know until you know it. So read, pick up some books and fill your mind with positivity and things that you did not know. Start with the word of God. And then she, she got a book. She just listed two books. If you're struggling with rejection, invest in your health. Buy the books and read them. You see that? The other lady, she gave a course, a free course. I purposely left it in there. Who picked up on it? Did anybody pick up on it? It's a free course. I could have edited that out. I left it in there on purpose. See, we want people to just hand stuff to us. 
No, we have to be paying attention, always looking for opportunities to grow. And then when they present themselves, we need to maximize it. Before I was in a, a spiritual place that I understood the necessity to sow into my spiritual growth and development, I, everything free, I, I, I maximized it. If it was free, I maximized it. If there was having a service over here about something that I needed, I, I went to the services. I watched the stuff, free stuff. And then as, as I be, as I, as my healing began to take place, I began to understand the need to actually sow, to actually sow into my, into my uh, spiritual growth and development. I wrote down, we are conditioned to numb the pain. And there's so many ways that you can numb it. There's the world is filled with ways to numb it. Drugs, Alcohol, weed, cigarettes, sex, money, working. You work, you work, you, you, oh my. You have children at home, but you're numbing your pain by working to keep yourself busy so you don't got to think about all of the pain you're going through. But you also not thinking about them babies that don't never see you. Now, now you, now, now they traumatized because their mama not never home. You see how that works? We have to make some sacrifices. I wrote, the only way to get to the healing is to get to the dealing of the wounds. The only way to get to the healing is to get to the dealing of the wounds. Amen. Amen. Did you write, what did you have? Um, I said that she, she started writing, she started writing about her book two years before she even experienced what she was experiencing. So God was preparing her for what she was going to experience. And I like how she said that he was entrusting her. Yeah. He was entrusting her with that experience, trusting that she was going to do the right thing in that situation. Yep. That's the, it go, ties back to testimonies. Our tests provide a testimony, right? We go through things, but, but, but we're, but God allows us to grow through them. And then we share our testimony. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And our testimony gives other people hope to know that you can get, she got through this, you can get through this. And this is how she got through this. And this is how you can get through it. Right? That was, that was good. And another thing, you know, what was the word God gave me? Fast, pray, fast, prepare and be ready. Fast, prepare and be ready. Right. We got to fast, prepare and be ready for whatever is coming our way. I can just think about this whole this whole challenge, man. Like. I was advertising this thing and I didn't have 31 days and I didn't have that one message. I just know God told me to do it. <laughs> so, so I just did it. I literally get I don't even have the work for tomorrow. I literally get fresh manna every day. Nine o'clock a.m. to three o'clock p.m. I'm studying for whatever I'm going to present that night. And, and Holy Spirit has never failed. We on what? Day 16? Mm -hmm. Every single day. And Saturdays and Sundays. Sunday, I had two hours. Mm -hmm. And Holy Spirit did that thing. It's not me. Holy Spirit did that thing. Fast, pray, fast, prepare, and be ready for whatever it is. Because God can... If you just open yourself up to be used, he can use you in any kind of way. He can use your trauma. He can use your faithfulness. Can he trust you? That's what he want to know. Can he trust you? Can he trust you to hear his word and to obey his word? God gave her the word two years ago. He just wanted, can, can I trust you? Will you put in the work? She said, yes. She wrote the book, had no idea she was writing it for herself. We don't always have to understand things. We just need to obey. God said, do this. Yes, sir. That's it. And let, and, and just, just be willing and able, right? And he will, he will work it out and he will come through. That's, that's, that's faith. That requires faith and trust in him. Amen. Glory to God. What else you got? Um, I, I said also about filling her home with the praise music. Yep, know. I touched on that while you was um while you was getting situated. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
I think we got some stuff in here. Let's see. Let's start with this one. I think this is where it starts. Mm -hmm. This put in my mind of sometime I like being by myself and learning me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very important to know you. Oh, yeah. God, and you got to spend time. You got to spend time and be aware. That's very important. God break you to correct or for you to correct you to become something better. This didn't, don't work for everybody because everybody think broken rejection is different, but ending in the design of li living you and not with the wrong things. Being alone might not be for everybody, but I love being alone and I like quiet. Yes, there are some introverts, right? You have introverts who they love it. But even if you don't love it, there's times when you still need to be alone. Mm -hmm. Jesus got alone. He was sweating. He, he was sweating drops of blood. He didn't enjoy that. He didn't enjoy that time alone of being alone, but it was needed and it was necessary. So sometimes even if you don't like it, you still need to be alone because that's when you can hear God's still small voice Woo! and receive comfort, receive encouragement, receive instruction. Right. So there are times of being alone that every body needs to embrace. That's different than being lonely, right? We talked about that already. So if you didn't hear that one, go back and check that one out. Anybody that's listening, right? But yes, absolutely. Let's see here. I think she said in order to get to the healing, you have to deal with the feeling. We don't like to feel the pain. Yep. She said dealing, but this is the same thing. When you're dealing with it, oh, you feeling it. When you're dealing with it, you're feeling it. People don't like pain, but as we said earlier, all pain is not bad. People just assume pain is bad. Childbirth is horrible pain, but something good comes out of it. It's horrible pain. My ch my daughters asked me, they tried. <laughs> I got a I got a recording. Oh, they watched that thing and they eyes was like, <laughs> they eyes we got this big. Like, Ma, are you okay? They like, I, they was like, Ma, are you okay? I was like, that was 25 years ago. Yeah, I'm all right. I done been through that thing a whole bunch of times more, right? <laughs> oh, man, that was so funny. They looked at me and said, Ma, you all right? Like, that was 25 years ago, son. Yes, I'm all right. <laughs> Amen. But that was excruciating pain. But not all pain is bad pain. Good things come out of pain. And God has never gone. If God is allowing us to go through pain, it's to make us better. If there's going to be a good thing that comes from that pain. If God is allowing us to have pain, there's going to be a good thing that comes from that pain. And the pain is going to, it's not going to last always. It's going to hurt while you're going through it, but you're going to get through it. It hurt while you went through it, but you got through it. Amen. Amen. Hearing the learning of God and his word helped my peace and quiet. Yep. Hearing the word of God. It calms you. That was what she said. Only God can turn a test into a testimony. Yep. With strength. Mm -hmm. We receive strength from God. We were strength. We, 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 we receive strength through our trials and tribulations and all of that. What's that scripture? It's in my weakness that God is made, that I'm made strong, that God is manifest strong in us. It's when we're weak that God manifests strongly in us. Right? Amen. Amen. So let's get to our scripture so we can get out of here. Transformational thinking, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will fulfill God's good, acceptable and perfect purpose for your life. Here's the uh, scripture about rejection. I think this is the one for you created my in, um, inmost part being. This is the way we got to think about rejection, right? We got to, we got to begin to embrace who God created us to be for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them ever came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. God's thoughts towards us. We are on God's mind. Do you know that? You, you, you something special. You are on God's mind. He cares about you. He loves you. He has your best interests at heart. You just have to trust him that every situation and circumstance is for your best interest. Even with the, with the devil meant for evil, God will turn that thing around for your good. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves you. Amen. Glory to God. So for as a man thinketh, so is he. So we got to change our thinking. We need to begin to think the way God thinks, see things the way God sees things, see ourselves the way God sees us. Think about ourselves the way God thinks about us. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. It's all a mental thing. I think it's Joyce Myers who coined the statement, the battlefield is in our mind. Amen. We got to cast down those imaginations. We got to cast down that rejection, reject the rejection. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself, not part of yourself, not the top and not the, not the bottom, not the left and not the right. All of yourselves set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, your logical, your intellectual act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. When you are when you're operating a rejection, you're not you're not thinking rationally. You're not thinking logically. You're not thinking intellectually. You're operating out of pain. You're operating out of loneliness. You're operating out of um, abandonment. These are the, the, the core, the core um, of fear and anxieties, right? That's what you're operating out of. We got to change that. You have to be intentional to change that. Acknowledge, acknowledge that, 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 that these wounds are pouring out. These wounds are still seeping. And, 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 heal, and get them healed. Amen. So that our thinking can become clear. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with the superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually. As you mature spiritually, you will, you will be transformed and progressively changed. Your thinking will become transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually. How do you do that? By the renewing of your mind, by focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. What is God's will for you? It is good. It is acceptable. It is perfect. It is purposed for you. We just got to begin to trust that. We got trust issues. Start with trusting God. It's not other people that you don't trust. You don't trust God. Start there. It's not that not, you, you don't trust other people. That That's the only people you don't trust is what I'm getting at. You don't trust people. But the root is you don't trust God. Right? Because even because if you trust God, even if you don't trust people, you won't feel rejected. <sighs> if you trust God, even if you don't trust people, you won't feel rejected. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But the fruit of the spirit, the result of his presence within us is love. Um, unselfish concern for others. Joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait. But how we act while we're waiting, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified this sinful nature together with its passions and appetites. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Holy Spirit. 
It's not just about talking the talk. It's about walking the walk with the personal integrity, godly character, and moral courage, our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit. If we're walking around with, 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 in a state of rejection, we're not being, we're not empowered by the Holy Spirit. We're being powered by fear. We're functioning out of fear, out of rejection, out of loneliness, out of trauma, out of hurt. That's how we're, that's how we're conducting ourselves. Amen. So we got to choose to heal because God wants to heal us. We got to choose life because abundant life is available to us. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. The only way to get to that abundant life is through Jesus Christ. He, 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 he died for you so that you could have access to God and all God offers. Amen. Oh, this thing is sticking again. Freedom is coming forth, enemy. It's going to still come forth, whether these slides work or not. The thief Satan comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I, Jesus, came that they might have life and have it um, in abundance to the full till it overflows. What is abundant life? What is an overflow? An overflow of the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Amen? Do not let your heart be troubled. It's a choice. Afraid, cowardly, believe confidently in God and trust in him. It's a choice. Have faith. It's a choice. Hold on to it. It's a choice. Rely on it. It's a choice. Keep going. It's a choice. Believe also in me. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. We have to be, we have to own that. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Thing. Oh, let me see about this. Did that work? Yeah. <sighs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. Let the peace of Christ, the inner calm of the one who, who, who walks daily with him, be the controlling factor in your hearts, deciding and settling questions that arise. This peace, indeed, you were called Indeed, you were called as members in one body of believers and be thankful to God always. That the, Joyce Meyer said something powerful. She says she's thankful for what she, she, she went through because it helped her to become the person that she is now. That's powerful. That takes a lot of growth and maturity. Amen. Because some people went through some horrible, horrible things. Ask God to help you to see why did he let you go through that? It's because he wants you, it, 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 he, so that you can become who he wants you to become after the fact, right? Some people went through some horrible things. But God is able to turn situations around for your good and for the good of others. Some of us are sitting on gifts because we're wounded. You're sitting on gifts for the body, gifts that that break generational curses in your own bloodline is being held up. Amen. Because of lack of healing, but God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, a victim into a victor who has victory. Somebody say, I am victorious. I am victorious. Somebody type, I am victorious. Amen. Glory to God. So don't just talk about it. Be about it. Do something different in order to get different results. The heartfelt and pers per persistent prayer of a righteous man, believer, is able to accomplish much when you put it in action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Prayer has tremendous power. Have you prayed about that thing? Have you sought the Lord on the authority of his word? So that he can answer you and deliver you from all of your fears, from all of your rejection, from all of your loneliness, from all of your trauma. Amen. Have you accepted the gift of salvation? Have you acknowledged you're a sinner in need of a savior from sin? Have you believed that Jesus Christ is that savior because he was willingly crucified on the cross for your sins? He was buried and then rose from the dead with all power to resist sin that separates you from God. Have you confessed that Jesus is the Lord of your life and God is your heavenly father? That's where it starts. 
That's where it starts. Repent if you haven't. If you haven't trusted him, right? Accept the gift of salvation and then repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past. Live your life in a way that proves repentance. Seek God's purpose for your life, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Listen, some of y'all ain't got no, that long here left on earth. Some of y'all don't have that long here left on earth, right? So begin, so, so regret, begin now to regret your past sins by living your life in a way that proves that you are, you have repented, that proves that you are sorry. Allow your best, allow your last days to be your best days. Allow your let Jesus, it only took Jesus three years. Do you know how much you can do for the kingdom in three years? You've been sitting on a gift for, for 50 years and you can you can rectify that in three. If you make a choice to regret your past sins, to live your life from this day forward in a way that proves repentance, you can make up for 50 years in three. Jesus said, greater works will you do. So if he did it in three, you can do it in at least three. Might be able to do it in two. Might be able to do it in one. Because he said, greater works will you do. Amen. It's not over until it's over. It's not. Somebody needs to say that. Put your hand on your chest and say, it is not over until it, the devil got you thinking that there's no point. That you're too old. That you can't change. That anything you do from this day forward is not going to matter. Oh, oh, it, oh, but it is. You got, you got, you got curses to break in your bloodline. You got children and grandchildren to set free. You got children and grandchildren to, to, to lead to Christ, to walk them through the ABCs of salvation. Don't you want to see that before you die and go to heaven? Don't you want to see that? Your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren serving the Lord? Don't believe the enemy. It ain't over until it's over. It's not over until it's over. Somebody say, it's not over until it's over. Somebody type, it's not over until it's over. You can make a choice to regret your past sins and live your life in a way that proves repentance. From this day forward, it's a choice. It's a choice. Somebody say, it's a choice. <laughs> it's a choice. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Here's the plan. You have rejection. You afraid of loneliness. Seek the Lord for guidance. Fast. Pray. Listen for the voice of God. Trust God. Worship God. Praise God. Obey God. And the fear, the rejection, the loneliness, the trauma will be defeated in the mighty name of Jesus because the Lord rebukes it. Woo! Hallelujah. And then thank God for the deliverance. Thank God for the healing. Thank him in advance. God, I thank you that you are healing me even now. I thank you, oh God, that you are restoring my mind even now. I thank you, God. Hallelujah. That you are transforming my stinking thinking even now. I thank you, God, that you are healing my heart even now. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise him in advance. Don't wait till the breakthrough come. Praise him because you trust him enough to do what he said he's going to do. It's his desire for you to be set free. Hallelujah. It's his desire for you to be healed. It's his desire for you to be whole. It's his desire for you to be his mouthpiece. It's his desire for you to spread the good news in the, of the gospel into all your realm of influence. That's God's desire. Whew. So fast. Crucify that flesh. Crucify that flesh and strengthen your spirit, man. Saturate your home, saturate your heart, saturate your mind, saturate your car with the word of God. Open up your mouth and praise him. Open up your mouth and worship him. 
unseal unzip those lips and give him glory don't allow the rock to cry out for you declare a line and decree position yourself keep saying it until you believe it lord the bible says somebody said god i believe but help my unbelief Woo. keep saying we got to keep declaring it until you believe it and then you can begin to decree it in the name of jesus say it with me God did not give me a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given me a spirit of power and of love and of sound judgment and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm, well-balanced mind and self-control. Hallelujah. I shall have peace. I shall have a, a, a sound mind. I shall operate in self-control. I shall operate in love, in joy, in peace in patience, in kindness, in goodness, in faithfulness. Hallelujah. It shall be. Hallelujah. Say it with me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will your ways to rebels and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O oh Lord, that my mouth may praise you. The sacrifices you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. Father, break us down so that you can build us up. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus, break every negative thought. Break every distorted di thinking hallelujah break the stronghold of the enemy break and tear down the strongholds that are negative that are not of god break the break the break Break the curses in our bloodline in the mighty name of Jesus. Satan, you are not welcome here. We say flee in the mighty name of Jesus. I rebuke you, but more importantly, the Lord rebukes you. You are not welcome here. Every spirit that is not like God, you are not welcome here. This is your eviction notice. Get out of my mind, devil. Get out of my heart, devil. Get out of my will, devil. Get out of my body, devil. Get out of my home, devil get out of my relationships devil get out of my finances devil get out of my children devil get out of my grandchildren devil get out you're not welcome here in the mighty name of Jesus Christ I plead the blood of Jesus from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet hallelujah we are victorious because of the blood of the lamb we are loved by god we are we were wonderfully and fearfully created by god we are his daughters we are his children we will serve him we will spread his good news in all of the earth in all of our realms of influence our lips will be unsealed we will not let a rock cry out for us <laughs> it's a choice declare it until you believe it and then decree it in the mighty power that is invest you you have power you have power declare it until you believe it until you can decree it until you until you have the, the 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 courage to walk boldly in the authority that is already vested in you it's already vested in you reshana masika tayala boshe yeah give the lord a hand of praise give the lord a round of applause hallelujah give the lord a praise Give the Lord a shalabo si kataya labo she ranama si kataya labo. Give the Lord a round of applause for what he has already done, for what he's doing in this very moment, for the healing that is already taking place. 
for the uprooting that is already taking place, for the dismantling that is already taking place. I shall not be caught in the rubble. I will come forth without smoke. Woo! I will come out of the fire with no smoke. You don't want this smoke, devil. Woo! Hallelujah. Woo. <laughs> oh, when y'all just begin to manifest that power, you already, it's already in you. It's already in you. Road to the better life is straight ahead. Don't get caught in the rubble <clears throat> trying to walk on a wide path that dips off and goes straight to hell. Stay on the straight and narrow. There's victory ahead. Amen. Mm -hmm. If you're not, if you're not growing spiritually in a church, come join us at Abundant Life Ministries. Woman to Woman is an outreach of Abundant Life Ministries of Aliquippa, where my husband and I are the founders. He is the pastor. We have service on Sundays at 1130 a.m. 2370 Hospital Drive in Aliquippa. We have Bible study on Wednesdays. Bring your children to youth dance that starts at six o'clock and stay for Bible study. This month, we're doing prayer at 530 Bible study at six o'clock so that we can get out a little bit early and let the ladies get back home and get a double dose of this word because we are we, we are committed to 31 days of taming fears, of overcoming fears, of receiving healing in the mighty name of Jesus. If any of these videos have been a blessing to you, share them. Don't be selfish. If any of these videos have been a blessing to you, share them. Invite people to the group so they can get the notifications themselves. Amen. I understand everybody's not in Beaver County. Everybody's not going to come to the church. Amen. But you can log on to the website and, and get you some healing. You can log on to the, a woman to woman and get you some healing. Amen. While it's available, while it's available, while it's available, you got to jump in the water while it's stirring, Pastor say. Mm -hmm. You got to jump in the water while it's stirring. Jump in the water while it's stirring. Healing is being released. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow I'm switching it up. This is not what's on the plan, but this is what how God is leading me. And so tomorrow we're going to be um, doing the fear of inadequacy because I think it goes very well with rejection. I think it goes very well with rejection. So we're going to we're going to stay on this on this wave that God is that we riding. Amen. And so tomorrow we're going to be doing taming the, the, the fear of inadequacy. Amen. So let us pray. Father, I thank you for you are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. I thank you. I feel like I already prayed. I done already prayed. I done already prayed. <laughs> say, we thank you, God, for what you have done in our midst on today. We thank you for what you have done over these last 16 days. We are at the halfway point. We're over the halfway point. We are over the halfway point, God. Hallelujah. So allow people to get in on this before they miss out what you're miss out on what you're doing. Allow people to get in on this before they miss out on what you're doing, because we're grateful and thankful for what you're doing. We thank you for every person who shows up, for every person whose heart is open to be healed, for every person whose mind is open to be transformed, for every person who is willing and able to receive what you are releasing. Hallelujah. So we pray that it falls on good ground that, sh that bears fruit that shall remain. We thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And we look forward to the fresh manna that you're going to release on tomorrow. So move in our bodies, oh God. Give us the rest that we need, the peace that we need. Hallelujah, that we can continue to press on, to, to we can continue to pursue you and to continue to pursue our healing. Hallelujah. Uh, we thank you, God. In Jesus' matchless, powerful, and mighty name, amen. Amen. I love y'all so much. I will see y'all on tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Thank you. 